Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diverse, diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com and follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore U. And of course, on our YouTube channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button and uh, check the notification bell for weekly videos. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this is made possible by our sponsors, OWC. For more information on how they can help you in your filmmaking needs, go to owcdigital.com. This week, I'm joined by Richard Crudo, ASC, the cinematographer for American Pie, Outside Providence, and Justified, just to name a few. Uh, welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, I have one question that I'm excited to ask you, and it has nothing to do with cinematography, and that is you worked on Ghostbusters 2. <laughs> what, yes, I, I, what was that like? <laughs> I was, I was uh, an assistant cameraman on that film, and I was, um, I was the dedicated steady cam assistant to an operator named Larry McConkie, who, mm -hmm. um, to my estimation, is, is the far and away the best person to ever pick up a steady cam. And um, we were there for the New York portion of the film, which was about six weeks of shooting in whatever year that was, I guess in the mid eighties. Um, as I recall, we didn't do a lot of work. Uh, okay. We were just on station and uh, waiting for the call whenever the director Ivan Reitman decided he wanted some steady cam. And I recall that we went quite a few days, maybe weeks in fact, without actually executing a shot. And then uh, towards the end, um, it got busy. We got called on a lot more frequently and did more work. But as I recall, it was a very, um, very pleasant, and enjoyable movie and a lot of laughs on set and um, nice people all around. That's great to hear. Now, before we came on here, we were chatting about um, the how versus the why in, uh, in cinematography. Can you elaborate on that or discuss yeah, that? Yeah, certainly. Um, students, young people, young people just starting out in their careers very often uh, we'll have questions, certain technical questions, and they're all valid and they, they, they generally have an answer, but people are in the most point, uh, young people especially, are looking for one size fits all answers to whatever question, it might be about camera, lighting, whatever it might be. And um, those questions don't really exist. I mean, those answers really don't exist. You need some sort of context in which to frame that answer. Um, you know, you can't say that you know, you would shoot night exterior like this all the time, or go into a, a supermarket with overwhelming amounts of fluorescent lighting overhead, and I would shoot it like this. There has to be some context to what you're doing, because it's not just about getting an exposure or doing something technically correct. It has to be about creating the mood, which is proper to the story you're working with, which then leads to the reasons why the more important question to me is the reason why you're doing something. Um, there are a million ways, obviously, to skin this cat in whatever situation. And you're always influenced by budget, by manpower, by equipment, by time, by all of these things that are going to influence your choices to a certain extent where you might not be able to do exactly what you'd like to do, but you'll figure something else out within your means. Then it becomes a question of why are we doing it like this? What is the best approach to deliver what's on the page through the director's mind, how they interpret it? And always there are a thousand ways to do that. So if you approach it from that perspective to begin with, you, it will then help you to narrow down the many other choices you have in terms of technology. Um, I, the more I've do the, done this, the more I do it, is the more that I simplify and um, take away, do more with less, and always try to see the simplest way to an answer, even if you have to go to complex means in which to deliver something that looks essentially simple. Um, you're always going to be better off to take the cleanest, simplest approach of least resistance. And that's something that uh, young people, it, it takes a long time working at the craft to come to that on your own. And if they can alert themselves to it earlier in their development, I think it'll help them to develop a lot quicker. And that's something I think um, I, I would like to kick around more with students and, and young cinematographers. It doesn't come up often unless I bring it up. Do you think that's because of like, 
<clears throat> the I guess like the almost the celebrity status of equipment because <laughs> sometimes yes. you yes. know it's all about the equipment and to a great extent I think that's true there's an obsession with technology today which I get to a certain extent I think we're all fascinated by it otherwise we wouldn't be doing this mm -hmm. but it's not really what this is about you know it's I can't imagine a carpenter being too excited about the release of a new hammer, hammer. <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and uh, case in point, red camera just introduced the new camera yesterday or the day before. And the, the internet has been alive with people talking about it. And um, I don't know how to put this delicately, but I don't know who these people are. <laughs> who are these, these? They're almost like experts without resume. Yeah. And the, the obsession with the technology and their observations on it, you know, Conrad Hall used to say it's of no importance to know what the chemical composition of the Eastman negative is. And he was 100 percent correct. Uh, you know, it's how you use that negative. You understand its properties, but you don't need to know it on a molecular level. Well, it seems that people in many cases today are obsessed with the technology at the pixel level, which has its place certainly, but it really has no bearing on someone's uh, taste or their eye or their ability to deliver tasteful or appropriate cinematography. Which is crazy because I remember when I went to film school, it was like, here's the Airy BL we've been using since the 60s. <laughs> here's the Moviola we've been using for the last 30 years. And now it's like every year there's a new camera. Well, everything, everything seems to be made it to be as complicated as a moon launch now yes. you know it's funny that you that you bring this up because i was just 20 minutes ago on the phone with a director i'm about to work with and um an old friend and we go back since before the beginning and um you, we, we were talking about trying to zero in the look for this project that we're about to do we're going to do a pilot in uh, a couple of months and i said you know it used to be so simple you know, you'd shoot some tests on film negative, work with the lab, establish a set of printer lights, and you could communicate so cleanly and so simply and easily with the lab. And everything meant the same thing to everyone at the same time. And if you made a change or if there was an issue or something deviated, you knew immediately how to isolate it and fix it. And you basically created the look in camera. Certainly there were things you did in the lab, but you did most of the work at the lens at the time of exposure. Nowadays, it's like launching the second Normandy invasion. It's just crazy. Yeah. Um, and it gets more and more complex all the time instead of simpler on certain levels in terms of um, communication and precision uh, in discussions with the colorist. You know, you could call a, a film timer in the old days and say, you know, I saw dailies last night and they seem to be tending a little cool, you know, put two points of yellow and a point of red into it meant the exact same thing to that person as it did to me. And you knew exactly what you were going to get back. Talk to a colorist about that today. And you're going to say, well, it was a little cool last night. Make it a little warmer today. Well, their idea of warmer is going to be different from mine or anyone else's as it should be. But the communication and simplicity of what we do has yeah. just been um, sort of obliterated with the new technology. Although the flip side of that is we can do many, many more creative things than with the image than we ever could on film, much more easily, by the way. So oh, yeah, and I think when I think of color, it's like, is my monitor matching their monitor? Is there yes, like all these exactly. Those, those that... issues are, are very troubling and we work very hard to mitigate them. Uh, and keep everything on the same page. So the job of the cinematographer, ironically, has expanded almost exponentially. I mean, our responsibilities certainly have in terms of keeping the, the image online and keeping it consistent from stem to stern. I mean, it's never been so important for a cinematographer to be present at the end, at the end of post, yeah. to supervise that image. So. It's an, you know, it's an interesting trade-off. We've gained a lot, but we've also um, gained other problems as well, or other challenges, you know. Is that why you created Normal Exposure, the blog? Well, the blog came out of boredom, COVID boredom, I yeah. should say, COVID boredom. Um, and it's aimed at students uh, primarily. And um, 
it grew from, I, I deal with a lot of students over time, and it grew from things that I've been hearing from students what, over and over again, what they're interested in and what they want to know about. And um, it, the time just was right. I had spare time on my hands and it just felt like something that was fun to do. And I've enjoyed it. The feedback has been good. And um, I'll continue to do it for as long as I can or think I have anything interesting to say, which could run out at any time. Yeah, or you can get busy with a show. <laughs> <clears throat> what would you say like your working relationship is with the colorist then since it's changed so much? Well, the colorist is a very, very close collaborator and it's great to have a fresh set of eyes. Um, I like to shoot a pretty extensive battery of tests if I'm going into a project uh, of any length and establish the look ahead of time, establish some LUTs and, and really create some boundaries for what we're trying to do. And then from there, at the finishing process, you try to take it that extra 3% across the goal line, but to have that fresh set of eyes at that point, who will be able to look at the material a little bit dispassionately and maybe bring something new to it is always a good thing. Um, every colorist, colorist has a different approach and a different temperament and different tastes. So it's good when you can establish some relationships with people over time and you get to know each other. And it's like anything else that we do, it just becomes a lot easier and a lot more familiar. Now you're, you're also working on a documentary, if I'm not mistaken, for about Gordon Willis. How's yes. that, what was your, what was your reasoning behind taking that? Well, it's in the very early stages. We're just starting to get out of the gate with it. But um, when I was a very young assistant cameraman in New York, just coming up, uh, I had the very, very good fortune to work on Gordon's cruise on a number of movies and other projects, commercials and things that he was shooting at the time. And um, we all know him certainly from the Godfather films and um, I guess the great Woody Allen movies that he did in the mid and late seventies. And uh, during my career as an assistant, I worked with a pretty broad spectrum of top Hollywood cinematographers at the time. And I have to tell you that Gordon was head and shoulders above all of them in terms of his grasp of the technology and then being able to toss that technology out the window and just act intuitively and um, put his own stamp on things. And um, in 2004, it was, uh, I shot an interview with Gordon and also with Stephen Pizzello, who is the executive editor of American Cinematographer Magazine. Hmm. And Stephen has written a book about Gordon that's about to be published, but we're both big Gordon fans. So we interviewed Gordon at his home in Cape Cod. We shot about 10 hours of footage over two days and grilled him <laughs> to such a point. I don't think anybody else ever needs to ask him another question about any of his films. Yeah. Um, I finally had the opportunity to ask him questions about things that I had been wanting to ask since I was an assistant. Yeah. And it was a great time. He was very effusive and very forthcoming. And um, Stephen and I were looking at some of that footage one day and decided, you know, this has just been sitting here in the archive at the ASC. We really ought to do something with this. And from that grew the idea that, you know, we should really do a wider examination of his career and his work. And um, this interview will be part of that package. But, you know, when I watch it, when I watch the stuff now, he had a brilliant, he was a brilliant man. He had a very quick mind. And his observations about cinematography and movie making in general are just, they're priceless. They're to the point, incisive. They cut away all the nonsense and they get right to the meaning of what you're trying to do. And um, it's, I think it's going to be very good for everyone to see. It's a philosophy that is not so present anymore in the business. What do you think he would have thought of all the Marvel films like and how they're it's so green screen driven and BFI uh, yeah. <laughs> you know that really wasn't his aesthetic let's well, put that's, it that yeah, way. that's what I was thinking and I don't think um I I think I can confidently say it really wasn't to his taste mm -hmm. uh, I would love to have heard his observation because he had a great talent also for looking at a situation or a trend or something that was happening right in front of you and just summing it up in, in four or five words that nailed it right to the wall. And um, his, I'm sure he'd have some very interesting, maybe not so um, 
praiseworthy things to say about those movies today. Interesting. Now, you also, you worked on, you, you know, when I looked at your stuff, you've worked on Jane the Virgin and Justified and all these things. And what would you say, because you're going into a pilot right now, like you're talking, what would you say the challenge is of, or the difference in terms of working on something starting from the pilot versus coming in on a, to a show that has already been established? Well, Jane the Virgin, I only shot a couple of episodes for, um, thanks to my good buddy, Lowell Peterson, who was the principal cinematographer there and, and created the look of that show. And, and that's a challenge in itself because I'm there not to certainly put a stamp on anything or change anything. I have to be there to keep the house style mm -hmm. and um, that was established by Lowell. And fortunately, I had his crew to lean on and said, well, how would Lowell generally approach this particular scene, this set, this location, and riff off that. And you bring a little bit of yourself to it, of course, but try to just keep it between the lines. And um, it's a challenge and it's fun. Uh, starting from scratch with something completely new, a pilot, for example, you have the chance to create the look and, and put the, um, the stamp of style that the producers, director want to proceed with on the show. And that's always fun too. I find that a lot of fun actually, mm -hmm. because you can stretch and do things and hopefully that will follow through. If you don't end up shooting the series, hopefully it'll still follow through and you'll still feel that, that original stamp on it as it, as it progresses. So how do you like to approach it from, because like you said before, it's not about the equipment, it's about the story. And telling a good story so from as a as a person who paints with light how do you like to approach the script and work with the director to get that vision well you have to go to the page and talk to the director and basically i think it's it comes down to it's just sweat work you know you have to sit at the dining room table with each of you with the script and go through things line by line and and sort of elucidate from the director what they intend the tone to be you know, what is the overall tone for the piece that we're doing? Um, this one, which I, I can't say too much about at this moment, but it's noirish, it's um, dark, um, there's violence and that sort of thing. So that would imply a certain approach. But then again, it might imply that approach just on the surface, you know, or a dark, moody, dreary that might be exactly the right choice, but maybe the director has a different idea and say, you know, I want to play against the, the type, the trope, and maybe we can turn it on its head and let the, the drama play and make the look less obvious, you know, maybe make it stylish, but in a different way, in a different flavor, rather than the one that, that you'd automatically just assume, well, it's a, gangster thing or it's a horror thing and it has or it's comedy and it has to be up key you know maybe not maybe not so those hours and days that you sit there and then you look at locations and then that brings something new and then once the actors hit the set everything to me on a certain level goes out the window because now you're seeing it in life it comes alive and, and the actors bring a different energy and a different spin to the whole thing that you've been thinking about for weeks and weeks and weeks. And you've got to be alert enough and quick enough to know that, you know, we were on the wrong track. Here's something better in this moment that we didn't think of, but that's only possible. And that you're only capable of doing that because you put in the initial work, you know, it, one won't happen without the other. Or if it does, it'll only be half-baked. It'll never really um, be what it ought to be or what it has the potential to be. It's so interesting because talking about tone, because I've worked in post, and so we're given the footage and it has a tone set visually, but then we have to work with the tone and try and get make sure that we reinforce that. Um, so when you're, and like one of the things I found is when talking to students and you're trying to explain tone, it can kind of be a weird discussion because you're like, it's just a feeling. How do you, for young people coming up, how do you explain tone to them? Yeah, that's a hard one. That's a tricky one. Um, as a cinematographer, we take our lead from the director, certainly. But no matter how much you try to impose a certain tone, I always get the impression that the material 
has something baked into it that's going to come out one way or the other, no matter what you do to it. And it's your job to somehow decode that from the script and try to tailor your methods and your aesthetic to what that theme would be, that tone would be. Um, and there's any of a thousand ways to do it, you know, how we do it, you know, light, color, movement, all of these things in post-production in which you can manipulate everything anew. Um, all of these things have to be sort of herded into line to serve that one, that one tone, that overall overarching thing that guides the feel of the material. I, I don't know if I'm being completely clear about it, but it's hard. It's hard yeah. to do, let alone define. Yeah, but again, it's always tricky. But again, you know it when you see it. <laughs> you know, it's it's that same old story. And you see all the great movies and the movies that you probably liked for your whole life. You've enjoyed them on a certain level because of the tone. Is it very much? And it's something you almost can't define. It's just a feeling that comes across in the most successful films. It comes across like like a Sunday punch. You go, "Wow, that was terrific." And it's uniform, even though the story and the dramatic dramatics and what have you may go up and down and spike and what have you throughout the film. That tone is a through line that carries you through. And I would be hard to describe it in, in words. Yeah. It's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. But it's something I think you can be sensitive to and can feel and work your way through. If that makes any sense. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's why I'm always like when I have to explain it to someone like that is a tough it's a feeling. It's a you can yes. know it when you see it. And yes, yes. Well, that again goes back to you know the why we do things versus the how. Yeah. You know, there's a thousand ways how to do it, but the why. You know, why are you putting the camera here with that focal length lens with the light from that angle and this color and that movement? And, you know, all of those things add up, and it all comes down to what's in the pit of your chest, I think, because. I know myself, and I hear it from a lot of my colleagues over the years too. When you're doing something on a set, you've lit it or however you've done, and there's something that's not right that you don't feel right about, mm -hmm. it's enough to make you sick to your stomach. You walk away and you just go, oh, I don't know what I've done here. I just can't pinpoint what it is I don't like, but I just know it's not right. And at that time, you got to throw a flag and say, hey, I need a minute. Let me think this through. And very often, it can just be as simple as turning one light off. Yeah. You know, it can be that simple. And other times, it can just, it can be a heck of a lot more stress. But uh, generally, I find it's something simple. Just take something away. You've done too much. You know, you've over gilded the lily and you have to just pull yourself back a little bit and stop and maybe just simplify, 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 simplify. Gordon Willis, again, used to say, when I was an assistant, I heard him say on many occasions, it took him 30 years to learn to be simple. And I would say, God, what does that mean? It made no sense to me at the time. But as I grew up and then started to shoot, and I say, boy, I do I get it? Because your, your first tendency, especially early on, is to throw more and more and more and more. Yeah. And that's natural and um, normal. But you learn, no, 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 take away, take away, take away, less, 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 invariably better. So uh, sometimes you have to remind yourself of that to get yourself out of those ditches. Now, I have one last question that I, I've been asking everyone we've been interviewing. We've been stuck in this pandemic and a lot of people, have, when they're stuck in their homes because of waves and what have you, they turn to streaming services. Is there any show or movie you discovered on the streaming service that you think people should check out? You know, there was a film, uh, I think it was on Netflix, called The Dig. Okay. D-I-G, The Dig, with Ray Fiennes. And it yeah. um, takes place in England just prior to World War II. And um, I just fell upon it one night. I knew nothing about it. I just saw the little description on the screen. Oh, let me give this 20 minutes. I don't know what it is about that movie, but it just, it took me and put the hook in me. And I just adored that film. Yeah. Um, it's photographed by Mike Ely, who is the president of the BSC right now. He did an amazing job. And I was I was just shocked it wasn't recognized on any level during awards time. It was such a good movie. I, I, it's 
I advise everyone seeing this interview, give it, give it the time, go look at it. And there's a lot to learn from it. And it's a great story and very, very well done. Wow. Well, thank you so much for letting us interview. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. It's over already. It was so quick. We were just yeah. getting started. Well, if you're ever in Toronto, we'll have to grab a coffee. I would love to. I love, I've been there many times and I've enjoyed it immensely. I love Toronto. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, and that's it for this week, guys. Uh, make sure to check out filmmakeru.com for our latest courses and follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you and on YouTube, hit that subscribe bell or that hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell uh, to get notified for our weekly videos. I want to thank our guest and of course our sponsors, OWC. Go to OWC Digital for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching.